third lecture on solar system formation, exoplanets, and life in the universe. So, lot to come. Uh, so, I originally had signed up to talk about laboratory spectroscopy at higher frequencies than what Mike does, um, but I decided to spare you the pain of spectrometer schematics and instead switch because no one has yet talked about solar systems and we live in one and we should try to understand it. Um, what's that? I would go. Okay. Um, so I really like this this figure. Um, the NASA Ames uh, Astrochemistry Group did a Scientific American article back in the late 90s where they had this graphic put together but this is kind of Interstellar clouds, star formation, disks through to planets, and then an Earth-like planet and biomolecules. So in my research, I've spent most of my time up here, um, but I'm trying to understand how we get down here. And the field is moving in this direction. You will notice at astronomy meetings, there's a whole lot of exoplanet sessions these days. Um, and I really think the whole field of astronomy and astrochemistry is moving in that direction. So, and now because of new telescopes like ALMA, we are able to actually start to dissect some of that chemistry. So, we're going to go back to a very basic picture of star and planet formation and start from there. Uh, so you have an interstellar cloud, we've talked a lot about clouds this week. It starts to gravitationally collapse. As the star turns on, the temperature goes up. Over the course of some period of time, a hot core forms and then a, a young solar system and eventually all that material collapses into a rotating disk. There's infall into the disk, there's a bipolar outflow, and eventually you end up with a planet forming disk. We always thought they looked like this, and now we know they look like this. Um, so the young planets start to form, they curve out rings in the disk, and then eventually once they clear their path, you end up with a mature solar system like ours. So how do we get from here to here, and what does that do to the chemistry along the way? As I said, we always assumed this is what a disk would look like when a planet was forming, but up until all of we couldn't see it. People tried really hard. Um, and now this is like textbook. Um, <laughs> I think Jamila is probably working on a lot of images that look like this. Yes. So we can use the uh, unimaginable to me uh, spatial scale of ALMA to be able to zero in and start to see planet forming disks and actually see the gaps in the rings where planets are forming and sweeping out paths. And so we can start to look at this in terms of chemical imaging and understand the processes that are going on as we go from a hot core, so a, a pre-stellar core, to a hot core, to a disk, and then eventually to planet formation, how does the chemistry change? So, one of the, the things that we're interested in, in as a field is how did our solar system form? How did we end up with a proto-sun still embedded in the cloud? You end up accreting rocky planetesimals, and then at some point, things get cold enough, you can have ice on the objects. And this frost line, or sometimes it's called a snow line, is really important in determining where the dividing line is between rocky planets like Earth and gas giants like the ones we see in our solar system. And so how do you measure that frost line? You use chemistry. Um, so this is one of Carr and Ober's very first um, studies of a uh, snow line in a disk, and the idea here is if you, well, there's a lot of argument right now as to what molecules you should use to trace a snow line in a disk, but at this time, the conventional wisdom was CO freezes out in the outer disk, and when CO is depleted out of the gas phase, N2H plus actually increases. So if you do a map of N2H plus, you get a, a hole in the middle um, where the CO and the N2H plus react and go on to form other molecules, and so you can actually have a nice map of where that frost line occurs, where the CO, CO freeze out occurs. So this is the uh, solar mass object, and this ring 
of the snow line is actually at about the orbit of Neptune. So it looks like this is a fairly good model of snow lines in the disk and planet formation. There's a, some chemical controversy right now as to which molecules are actually the best tracers for this process. So there's a whole series of papers arguing for different chemical species based on what we understand about the chemistry in this. Um, there's also a lot of work in the field right now to take chemical models like we've applied to pre-stellar cores and hot cores and apply them to disks and understand what's going on. And again, it's this matter of adding the turbulence in versus getting the chemical network right. Um, but people are moving in that direction. So there's a lot we have left to learn. And as all my observations keep rolling in, we'll get more and more information and hopefully be able to sort this out. Um, we have actually now observed quite a lot of organic molecules in disks, which was a little bit of a surprise. We assumed they were so cold we wouldn't see much. Um, I think methylformate is probably, is that the biggest? Jamila might know. Which one is, what's the, what's the name? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see, methylformate. Uh, no, no, methylformate is HCO, uh, I'm going to write it down. H-C-O-O-C-H-3, yeah. H-C-O-O-C-H-3. Too early on a Friday morning to remember organic molecules. Um, so I think muscle formate's the biggest thing we've seen in the disk so far. Something around there. Um, people are certainly looking. Karin has a ton of all my data. Catherine Walsh has all my data. I think like HL Tau and a couple of other disks were like the first things anybody tried to look at with Alma, um, besides Orion. So um, lots and lots of chemical information coming back about this. Um, if you look at our solar system and you look at the way our solar system is constructed, you've got the rocky planets in the inner solar system, you've got the asteroid belt and then Jupiter, and then the gas giants from Jupiter out. We see comets coming in and orbiting the sun and going back out. There's the Kuiper belt and the ever controversial Pluto, which isn't a planet, but almost is a planet. If Pluto becomes a real planet, all sorts of things become planets, which is why Pluto got demoted. Um, if you want to follow the controversy, follow Mike Brown on Twitter. His Twitter handle is Pluto Killer. <laughs> but his group was looking at all these objects out in the Kuiper belt and figured out a bunch of them are bigger than Pluto. So that's what instigated the demotion of Pluto. Um, my freshman seminar students are always fascinated by that. Um, but if we look at our solar system and we try to understand how a typical solar system would form and what we might see as we look at other nascent solar systems, um, we can ask the question about how habitability changes as you go away from the star. So we know that Earth is habitable because we are here. Um, Mars potentially could have been early on, but probably isn't now. Venus is way too hot for life as we know it on Earth. And uh, so the question is, how do you define habitability? How do you define what you should look for if you're looking for astrobiology? Um, and how do you define the kind of chemical parameter space so that we can tell if they're biological processes versus naturally occurring processes. Uh, because astro, kind of astrophysics is moving in the direction of exoplanet searches and astrochemistry is moving in the direction of understanding planet formation, the issue of habitability is becoming ever increasingly important. And so we need to be able to settle on some definitions so that we can agree as a field. So I'm going to walk you through the NASA definition of habitability and what we know and what we don't know and what we don't know we don't know and <laughs> back to Donald Rumsfeld. All right. So the 2008 NASA Astrobiology Roadmap laid out this definition of a habitable planet. So the idea is a habitable, the head, habitable environment must provide extended regions of liquid water, conditions favorable for the assembly of complex organic molecules, and energy sources to sustain metabolism. 
So you really need these basic ingredients for life. So you need organic chemistry, liquid water, and energy for metabolism. Otherwise, the source is not habitable. I find that second one, the conditional conditions favorable for the assembly of organic molecules, interesting, as you said, in the, in the disks. Yes. Organic molecules yes. Are lower, so that's interesting in conditions. So I'll get to the origin of life theories, but panspermia is one that's been around for a long time, and the idea is that either the material for life or life itself was brought to Earth from elsewhere. Um, we can actually look at how organic material makes it through the star formation phase into the disk and then into the, the young bodies in a solar system, and a lot of that material does survive. Um, so it's possible that all of those ingredients were here when we started. Yeah? Habitable for what? Habitable uh, for life as we define it on Earth. That is also controversial. My life is different from the life of a microorganism. Right. Which lives, uh, so NASA astrobiology groups like to argue about life versus, well, intelligent life versus stupid life. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, yeah. we know how to live with a stupid life uh, on Earth. We know that. But uh, I'm not just referring to the intelligent life, but the actual form of life, the habitability for a microorganism at the bottom of the ocean at uh, 1,000 you know, gigapascal or whatever is, right. is not something that is useful for right. anything which is on the surface of the Earth, right? But it's still life. Right. So how do we define habitability? So they're looking for something that could give a signature that we could observe remotely and know that there is life present on that planetary system. In that respect, then, if I, if I find amino acid, it is life. Um, that is not the argument, but the argument, and I'll get into biosignatures in a minute, but the idea is we can point the James Webb Space Telescope at an exoplanet and we can tell from the spectrum that there is active life at the surface of that planet. So things that happen at the bottom of the ocean that don't affect the atmosphere probably wouldn't show up. But there are a lot of things that happen geologically that give off similar no, 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 spectral no. signatures to Earth-like surface for life. Those, for those biochemical uh, markers, I don't have any uh, clear on the same wavelengths. But I'm referring to habitability. I mean, you, you hear this buzzword over and over again from, uh, from everyone about habitability. Right. It's, it's, it has to have a definition. Well, habitability to NASA means liquid water. Just liquid water. Yep. That's how they define a habitable zone That's in it. a solar system outside of our Earth. So, yeah. condition for the sun. Yeah, but, yeah. but there has to be a very specific definition. So if it is just liquid water, yeah, OK, well, let's, let's define it. So the real challenge gets into solar systems are more complicated than the sun and the planets, you have moons, and we have a lot of moons in our solar system that have liquid water, whereas the major planets don't. And so how do you, we aren't to the point where we can observe exomoons yet, um, but that is certainly an area of research that we need to explore because that's probably the best chance we have of finding potentially habitable yeah, exo bodies. <laughs> Did you have a comment, John? Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering about uh, the effect of time, whether these whether it would be sensible to say that these conditions must must be stable uh, over some right. uh, significant period of time, right. uh, because you wouldn't consider uh, flare stars or uh, very rapidly evolving right. stars as providing. Right. It's unclear from what we stable. understand in evolution on Earth just how long you need life formed pretty early on right. Earth. Um, and so we, it's not clear how long the, the body has to live in a habitable regime before life could evolve. Um, yeah, there's a lot of debate about how you define habitability. There's even more debate about how you go about looking for astrobiology. Um, Mike said the other night, astrobiology is a real because we've never detected life anywhere but on Earth, so there is no astrobiology, which is true. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's a lot of debate in the field, but we're trying to get to the point where people are kind of on the same page with the formal
formal definitions so that when we start this sort of search, we have a starting spot and then we can kind of evolve the field from there. Um, so if you look at our solar system, our habitable zone, Earth is right in the sweet spot and it extends almost out to Mars. Mars did have liquid water at the surface at some point. And now the, the poles on Mars actually have quite significant amounts of frozen water. Um, Venus is much too warm uh, to support life as we know it, but uh, the habitable zone runs right in the middle here between Venus and Mars. So this is an interesting way to think about the question for me as a chemist, because everybody likes to talk about exoplanets and biosignatures of life elsewhere in the universe. I'm much more interested in what makes a planet or a zone habitable chemically. How do you get liquid water? How do you get organic molecules to the surface of a planet? And what does that mean once you seed a planet with that material and let it run? You know, what happens? How likely is it for life to evolve out of that complex mixture? Um, one of the very Susanna, first, yeah. One quick comment. Uh, the presence of water is not the only definition for a habitable zone. It's also the presence of CO2. Atmosphere, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Is, at least on Earth, CO2 is what drives the plants, and the plants are what drive us. Right. So, but you can look at Venus and Mars, which also have CO2. It's a combination of both. Yes, it's the That's combination of the two. Yes. Well, couldn't you go on to say that if uh, Venus had had just a somewhat smaller abundance of CO2, that it might have it might been have, able yeah. to it sit in the edge of the habitable zone right. for water? And for Mars, if it had a little bit more, like the terraforming of Mars plants actually inject greenhouse gases into the atmosphere to warm it up a little bit so that you can have a little water at the surface. So. Yeah. This is why biosphere's here, right? That was the point. Um, <laughs> so um, if you look at extrasolar planets, um, one of the early detections of planets in a habitable zone uh, was in the system Pleiades 581, and there's one right on the edge of the habitable zone and another right on the other edge of the habitable zone. And this kind of jumpstarted the field for looking at terrestrial light exoplanets that might be in habitable zones. At the time that this was detected, this was the plot of exoplanets. Um, there are a couple different ways you can detect exoplanets. The most common is to watch the central star and watch it wobble from the gravitational effect of the exoplanet. Uh, the other thing you could do is watch the star and watch the starlight dip as the planet transits. Um, that is much more challenging, especially from ground-based observatories. So early on, everything that had been detected were actually very massive planets. So this is the mass, the log base 10 and the mass of Jupiter. So everything was big. Earth is down here. Pleiades 581 is down here. Uh, this is distance from the, the star. So this was really one of the first discoveries of an Earth-like exoplanet. Uh, it's amazing how far we can come in a short period of time. Yesterday I downloaded the most recent update from the Kepler Observatory. So the idea of Kepler was go and look at every star it could find in a certain region of the sky and try to detect whether or not it had exoplanets. And pretty much every star they looked at had exoplanets. Um, and then they go back and do follow-up observations to confirm them. So the red are all of the Kepler planet candidates up to February 20th, 2020, and the blue are the ones that have been confirmed. There are 4,000 exoplanets that have been confirmed. This is in Earth radii and period and days, and so between these lines are the ones that they think have a chance of being habitable or Earth-like, and so you can see we have thousands of possibilities now. Um, this was there were like 20 exoplanets when I was in grad school, but now we have 4,000 and something. Um, <laughs> this is really incredible. This is why the LAS meetings have multiple sessions on exoplanets now. Um, so biosignatures. Biosignatures are signatures such as a chemical compound, an isotope, a cellular component that indicates the presence of a biological process. Again, we are assuming it will be Earth-like if we see it. 
There's a lot of controversy about what constitutes a biosignature. Um, this is particularly important because of a meteorite discovery that happened a couple decades ago now, which I'll show you in a minute, but there was a group that was arguing that they had seen evidence of bacteria in a Martian meteorite. And there was that there had never really been a debate about what constituted an actual smoking gun for a biosignature until that was reported. And so people have tried to set out rules. Uh, this is really challenging because you think you've found a good biosignature and then you find something that can happen naturally through geological processes. Um, and so you have to revamp. So we were talking about CO2 and Venus, Earth, and Mars. These are the atmospheric signatures of Venus, Earth, and Mars. You can see Earth has water and O3, um, ozone. Venus has CO2, Mars has CO2. Nitty, 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 nitty signatures here of water and ozone. Um, Venus doesn't have those. So you're looking for something, if you're looking at an atmospheric spectrum that doesn't exist naturally in the atmosphere, is it created by geophysical processes? Is it created by photochemistry in the atmosphere and has a strong spectrum? So there's a whole dedicated arm of James Webb Space Telescope development preparing for potential biosignatures in exoplanets. So the goal is to go and follow up on those Kepler planet candidates that are most Earth-like and see if they see anything in the infrared spectrum of the atmosphere that indicates that there might be biological processes at the surface of the planet. Susanna, just yeah. a question. Uh, the resolving power of data of is only 3,000. Right. Is that, do you think, sufficient to, to distinguish between all of these different um, things? There are simulations run, and you can see some of the major features, like the ones that I'm showing here, maybe not at this resolution, but you can see the major features. Mm -hmm. Um, the other, the molecules you would look for in Earth atmosphere that would be most indicative of life, you probably can't resolve. Um, so this is controversial, uh, but there are groups trying to come up with contingency plans so that they can do these observations. If nothing else, they want to understand the atmospheric chemistry in these exoplanets and understand how the size of the star and the distance from the star and the size of the planet influences the chemistry. And maybe we'll come up with something. I'm guessing it'll be an accident. There will be some signature we don't anticipate that everyone will suddenly realize, hey, that's probably what that means. But um, we might not find anything at all. Who knows? Um, do, people, like, do people know, or what is the state height inspection? Or some of the other. Um, I don't have a Titan spectrum up here. Titan's chemistry is very different. Um, a lot of nitrogen containing compounds in the atmosphere of Titan. And methane. Um, yeah, and methane. So there's methane lakes on Titan and a lot of nitrogen containing species in the atmosphere. So it would look very different than these three. Yeah. Is this another um, Enceladus and Europa are the other two in the solar system that are the most likely candidates. So Europa has liquid water at the surface and a lot of organic chemistry that looks terrestrial. Um, Enceladus is next door to Titan. Enceladus has an ocean with a layer of ice on the top, but it has the, they call them tiger stripes. There's cracks in the ice and under certain conditions Europa actually blast water jets in, like away from the moon, and some of that material actually lands on Titan's upper atmosphere and contributes to Titan's chemistry. Um, so no one knows what's under that ice on Enceladus. That's something that people are really interested in. But Europa is probably the most Earth-like of the three. But if NASA's going to send a mission to look for signs of life those in the solar system, those are the three bodies. So this is why the Dragonfly mission was just approved. They're going to send a quadcopter to Titan and drop it in the atmosphere and it's going to sample as it flies and then it's going to land at specific sites and take samples and take off again. What about contamination? Really, uh... Yeah, there's a whole branch of NASA that deals with contamination control. So we don't contaminate Titan. And it, yeah, they're not going to bring samples back from Titan, but they're bringing samples back from other places. So. But you're correct. You're very good at contaminating other things. Yes. <laughs>
Yes, we are. So yeah, Dragonfly just got approved six months ago. Um, there, it was a, they come up with concept missions and they run through the initial design and they'll have four or five and they'll get it to a certain level and they narrow it down to two and then they get it to the next level and then they pick one of the two. So Dragonfly was the Titan quadcopter. Its competitor was Caesar, which was a sample return mission from a comet. And I had a very hard time picking, but they're both fantastic. Many of my collaborators were on the Caesar project, so I'm sad for them and relieved because if they would have done Caesar, I wouldn't have worked with them for years. Um, <laughs> so uh, maybe they'll go in again. I don't know. It was I. I don't know how they made that decision. I don't know how I would have chosen. Um, the other thing we can do is look for geological biosignatures. If we can bring back samples from a planetary surface, from a comet, from a whatever, um, or if we can pick up meteorites on Earth, we can look for things that are evidence of microfossils. Uh, organic molecules, isotopic ratios that indicate biological processes or biominerals. This is really controversial because of the discovery of a Martian meteorite that had what looked like biosignatures in it. Um, there are expeditions to Antarctica to pick up meteorites. So meteorites often look like rocks, earth rocks. And in Antarctica, you can walk across the ice plane and pick them up and be fairly certain that they're meteorites because there's very little exposed rock in Antarctica. Um, so there are actual expeditions to go collect meteorites from Antarctica, and one in particular from the Allen Hills region of Antarctica, Allen Hills 84001. Um, there was a group at NASA, um, Johnson, was it Johnson? Houston. That's Johnson, right? And that's, they uh, had this sample. That's actually where the meteorite collection for NASA is curated. Um, they did cross sections of this and were looking for various things in the meteorite. And they started to find these tubular structures in the meteorite that looked like leftover fossils from bacterial life. So they wrote a paper. And this went public, and people got very excited. Um, and people have since gone back and done inorganic chemical, like geo processes, and reproduced the structure of these things using non biologically based chemistry. And so it looks like no one knows um, basically whether or not it was any sign of anything that was biological, but there are non biological pathways that can give you the same sorts of results. I was an undergrad working on meteorites at the time of this discovery, and every spring break, my advisor and I would go to the Lunar Planetary Science Conference. So when they would give a talk on this thing, like it was standing room only, and all the press was there, and everybody was all excited. Um, it was really controversial. It, it what, what dragged science? out for several years. So the conclusion of that was morphology cannot be used unambiguously as a tool for primitive life detection. So yeah, I, I could be wrong, but I thought in the end the the size scale is maybe what you were yeah, what is, is, size. is is less than than the um, thickness of the smallest single cell organism on it. It was size, and I think there were also some mineralogy studies where they could reproduce the basic processes using. Basic so I think in the end it was ultimately discredited. Yeah, yeah, no, they decided that there's no way that it could have been in the end, but. It caused a lot of debate in the field about what actually constitutes a biosignature when you have sample return missions, because you have to settle on a common set of rules, basically. Um, so looking at Earth and looking at the chemistry that we know happened on Earth and in our solar system, where are we in our understanding of life on Earth and our solar system and what we might see in other similar sorts of solar systems in the universe. So early on in our solar system for formation, there was a migration of heavy planets. Um, Neptune got destabilized in its orbit. It was actually much closer to the sun and basically took a walk into the outer solar system. And with it disrupted many of the larger gas giant planets in our solar system. And from this, 
basically set up Jupiter as our shield. It collects much of the outer solar system material that would normally hit Earth because it is so big. Um, and because of Jupiter's shielding effect, we have been protected from some impacts and some cataclysmic events that might have completely changed the chemistry of early Earth um, because whatever happened with Neptune and Jupiter happened and um, all the Kuiper Belt objects actually got scout scattered out into the outer solar system based on this event. There was a period in early Earth formation that's now called the late heavy bombardment period. You can actually look at um, mass flux from impacts and there's this huge spike. Uh, this was in the period where Earth was still in the Hadean period. Hades, hell. Um, it was hot, volcanic, uh, very little had condensed at the surface. Earth was getting hit by all of the material in the orbit that it was in as it was forming some bigger and bigger objects within Earth, lots of cometary impacts. Um, and we think much of the material that we now see at the surface of the Earth may have actually been delivered through those impact events. So we know this from our solar system. Also, when I was a young scientist, I was in high school when this happened. Um, this is Shoemaker Levy 9. It was a disintegrated comet that actually they realized at some point was going to directly impact Jupiter and all eyes were on Jupiter that day and all of these pieces of the comet actually hit Jupiter and there are beautiful pictures of the there are still uh, impact evidence and observations of Jupiter from the debris left from these impacts. It's really spectacular. So we know that everything in the solar system has been hit by cometary and meteorite impacts. And so the question is, how does that influence the chemistry of these objects? Is it still influencing the chemistry of these objects? And what got delivered from the early solar system to Earth and the other planets based on these impacts? So I showed the interplanetary dust particle before. I'll show it again. Um, Lucy talked a bit about this the other day in terms of you know, you have amorphous carbon, you have silicon carbide, you have other minerals. All of this material rains down on Earth all the time. This was collected in an upper atmospheric plane where they basically stick fly paper out and collect uh, interplanetary dust particles and micrometeorites in the upper atmosphere. Um, some definition before we get started on meteorites. It's a piece of rock or metal that has hit the ground. So meteors go through the atmosphere, meteorites hit the surface. Um, so we have meteor showers all the time. Um, we can go out in Antarctica and pick up meteorites. The metal meteorites are pretty obvious even away from Antarctica, but the carbonaceous ones are not. They look like earth rocks. Um, so if you see a fall, you can go pick them up, but otherwise you kind of have to know, you have to use isotopic analysis to be able to tell what it is. So these are different types of meteorites. A lot of our meteorites came from Mars. Um, not all of them though. The chondrites actually came from the early solar system. So chondritic meteorites look like rocks. They're made up of pre-solar material um, in a carbonaceous matrix and they have little spherules embedded in them and we'll get to more detail on that in a minute. Iron meteorites came from the core of another object being formed. Halocyte meteorites come from the mantle, and achondritic stony meteorites come from the crust. And so a lot of the meteorites we have on Earth are actually left over from Mars forming um, and getting delivered to Earth. Um, <coughs> chondritic stony meteorites are a special class, though, especially carbonaceous chondrites. One, they're beautiful, but two, they contain the pristine material from our solar nebula. Um, so they're very primitive meteorites. They have the oldest material left in our solar system. They're called chondrites because there are chondrules, these little spiral things embedded in the matrix. The matrix in a carbonaceous chondrite is actually highly carbonaceous. This is why it's dark in color. Um, there's graphitic carbon, 
There's uh, these large organic carrageen type species that are basically PAHs assembled into large macromolecules. There's a lot of organic material, some of which is known to be biologically relevant, embedded in these con chondrites, um, in the carbonaceous chondrite matrix. And then the little chondrules are little mineral deposits. And within those, we also know that we have what are called presolar grains. So Lucy mentioned this the other day. Presolar grains are little spherules of silicates. Um, they're basically the pristine dust from the presolar nebula. Um, they're found in carbonaceous chondrites, and there are people who've spent their life work analyzing the isotopic signatures and the composition of free solar grains to try to figure out what the chemistry was in the early solar system. As someone who looks for organic molecules in space, I'm really interested in the carbonaceous matrix rather than the free solar grains. Um, this is the Murchison meteorite. It's one of the most famous in terms of carbonaceous chondrites. It's incredibly rich in organic material within the carbonaceous matrix. Um, they have found dozens of amino acids, many of which do not occur in life on Earth, in the Murchison meteorite. They have found sugars and other polyhydroxylated species, and they have found a whole suite of other organic molecules in uh, pieces of the Murchison meteorite. Um, Murchison fell in Australia, anybody know the year? I don't remember. 69, and like the impact was seen, and so people went out and picked up samples. The other really famous uh, carbonaceous chondrite that's done, had a lot of analytical work done is Allende. It fell in Mexico around the same time, and actually, um, um, oh, why am I blanking on his name? From Caltech, the lunatic asylum geologist. Jerry Wasserberg. Jerry Wasserberg was a professor in uh, planetary science and geology at Caltech. Jerry had run the lab that analyzed all the lunar samples. They named it the Lunatic Asylum. Um, it's still there. Um, but Jerry found out about this fall, loaded up in his pickup truck, and went to Mexico. Um, the local government had gone through, because after the fall, all the people in the Yende had gone out and picked up pieces. And the local government went through and tried to get the material from them, and the, they figured out quickly it was worth money, and they didn't give it up. And Jerry showed up with his pickup truck and apparently $100 bills, and came home with a whole truckload of Allende pieces, <laughs> and like spent the, uh, there's a huge collection of Allende pieces at Caltech, because Jerry went and bought them from the locals and brought them home. So yes. Just, those two fell at the same time, but I think they came from the same source. I don't think so. I think it was just, yeah, we get hit by stuff all the time. They're just not often big enough that anybody pays any attention. Um, but if you go through Murchison, you go through Allende, you go through some of the other major carbonaceous chondrites, um, there are people at NASA Goddard, in particular Danny Glavin's group, that extract organic molecules from these carbonaceous chondrites, and they actually look at the chemistry. So this is a study where they had a whole suite of carbonaceous chondrites, there's Murchison, um, and they analyzed them for alpha alanine, beta alanine, let's see here, alpha amino isobutyric acid and isovaline, and they could get the ratios of the different types of amino acids, and then they could look at trends based on the level of what's called aqueous alteration in the meteorite. How many times was it warmed up and cooled down? and the water um, actually, you know, was taken to liquid form so that reactions could happen and then it froze again. Um, so the more alteration there is, the higher some of these amino acids go. So it's pretty clear that some of the amino acids that we see in meteorites are forming because of the condensed phase chemistry in the meteorite. Um, comets are a different Read, but have very similarly interesting chemistry. Um, so a comet is an object that develops a long right tail when it passes near the sun. I got to comets before Lucy got here, which is good because she's the comet expert. And I kept emailing when we were planning and saying, Lucy, are you going to talk about comets? Um, 
and she never answered, so I'm going to talk about comets. Um, so comets are really interesting chemically. Um, the comets from the outer solar system, much like carbonaceous chondrites, are thought to be some of the most pristine material left from the formation of our solar system. They come in, they go around the sun, they warm up as they get close to the sun, stuff comes off, that's what causes the tail, and then they go back out. Um, and different comets of different periods actually have somewhat different chemical classifications. Uh, we know in that early uh, bombardment period that comets were hitting early Earth frequently. And we think a lot of the material that's actually seen now at the surface of Earth came from those cometary impacts. So if you look at a comet structure, you've got the solid core. There's a coma around the core where things are vaporized from the heat of the star and ejected into the gas phase. Comets are mostly water. And so most of that gas is water. There's an ion tail that points away from the sun. And there's a dust tail that's the debris left behind as the comet passes through. So the ion tail is the stuff that's getting blasted off by the solar radiation. The dust tail is just the track that it leaves in its wake. Many of our most prolific uh, Meteor showers are actually when Earth flies through the debris from the dust tail from a comet. But we have visited comets several times. Here's a set of the visuals of the comets that we have sent probes to visit. So Comet Halley is the big one. Um, we visited Halley in 1986. The Stardust mission went to Vilt 2. Uh, 2004, let's see, 67P is where Rosetta and the Philae lander went. Um, Hartley 2, we observed and then we actually, uh, well, Hartley 2, we flew past and then Temple 1, we actually smacked the probe into the comet and recorded specter of the things that came off when we hit it. Um, and then 19P was actually visited in 2001. So kind of the 2000 to 2010 range had a lot of comet activity, which was really helpful for Stephanie Milam getting her PhD because she observed chem chemistry in all of them. Um, <laughs> so she was a grad student with Lucy. Um, she's now deputy science director for James Webb Space Telescope. So um, we have seen amino acids in comets. The first was Comet Bill 2. They actually flew a mass spec through the tail and collected information and saw signatures of glycine. Um, since then, Rosetta actually saw glycine and a few other amino acids on um, 67P. One of the most exciting discoveries was um, in a Jupiter family comet, Hartley 2. Uh, Derek Liss and co-workers actually looked at the ortho to para ratio of water in that comet using the Herschel Observatory and found an ortho to para ratio that was similar to Earth's ocean water, indicating that perhaps Jupiter family comets were responsible for the delivery of water to early Earth. Um, this is somewhat debatable at this point. Last time I asked Derek what he thinks, he said, I have no idea. Um, yes? You're, you're referring to the deal of the ratio, right? Yeah. Not the ortho to par. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. It's Friday morning. I meant yeah. the D to H ratio yeah. of the water. So if you look a plot at a plot of D to H ratios, here's Earth, here's all the other planets, and the proto-solar uh, value, the interstellar value, here's Enceladus that I mentioned earlier. Here's a bunch of comets that are all higher D to H ratios than Earth's ocean water. And Hartley 2 is a different type of comet from a different part of the solar system. And Hartley 2 has a D to H ratio that actually matches Earth's oceans. Everybody got really excited. Uh, Jupiter family comets are harder to observe. There haven't been as many chances to look at those. And so this was really exciting. Lots of press releases and interviews and, and all of that. Um, actually, if you look at the Rosetta mission, 67P is also a Jupiter family comet. And it turns out that its D to H ratio was very different. 
So here's the same plot in different colors. Um, here's Earth, here's the asteroids, here's Enceladus, here's all those other comets. Here's Hartley 2 right on the line, and 67P is up here. Um, so we don't know what it is about comets that presumably come from the same place in the solar system and should be very similar chemically, but these are very different, and so the jury's still out onto whether Jupiter family comets are the source of our water or not. Um, nonetheless, at least some degree of our water came from cometary impact, and we think also some of the organic molecules. Yes? Um, any intuition for why Jupiter family weight uh, ratios are different from Jupiter's? Um, so, the Jupiter family comets have nothing to do with Jupiter uh, except that they're trapped by its gravitational influence. So they uh, think that uh, they actually come from the Kuiper belt, and when they come in, they get caught. Um, so they're actually Kuiper belt objects. Um, they just get dramatically influenced by Jupiter's gravity. So here, no, just on. Yeah. yeah. Class of theories which sort of look for um, physics beyond the standard model. And one of those, which actually now is being tested rigorously, is the time variation of the fine structure constant. Okay. If the fine structure constant were to change, and, and this of course is, has to be uh, shown, then if a slight variation in the fine structure constant can account for those differences. Okay. The question is if all the Jupiter family comets formed as the solar system was forming, why would they be different? There's yeah. a, there, we just don't, yeah. yeah the conditions a lot of are different, but, the, yeah. but those deviations or variations in D over H ratios could be explained yeah. by the variation in time to the fine structure. Uh, yeah. um, are those changes, the, the required changes consistent with the very low upper limits that have, that have already been placed on the cosmological time change. Uh, they, they must uh, be consistent with it. I don't, I don't know what I think so. It must be referring to the, to the uh, abundance of the D over H, right? the cosmological abundance. No, I'm no. referring to the, the measurements the, the from quasar absorption spectroscopy that actually put limits on uh, the variation of both the fine structure constant and the electron-proton mass ratio. Yes, yes, they must be consistent. I, I don't have the numbers, but... Just one those, great those comment are pretty about, small. <clears throat> one quick comment about asteroids and such, and quite the felt objects. There's so much randomization and chaotic motion in their orbits that just because they both appear to be Jupiter family comets doesn't mean that they right. come from the same Origin. Right. So. Um, the Rosetta mission was incredible despite the failure of the Philae lander. So, for those that don't know, Philae was supposed to land on the comet and put down anchors and do geological sampling and tests of the chemistry. Uh, the anchors didn't fire, and so Philae bounced a few times and landed behind a cliff. So, it turned on for a few hours and then got the sun got blocked and it couldn't recharge and it never responded after that. But even with just a few hours of data collection, all of these amazing molecules were detected um, by the Philae lander. Just think what it would have done if it would have actually anchored itself like it was supposed to. Um, yeah, that was incredible. But um, we see a whole range of uh, aromatic compounds, uh, organic molecules, prebiotic molecules, um, you see a lot of sulfur-containing molecules. Um, I like this cometary zoo because they kind of group them by, by classification. So you've got the smelly and the colorful, and the <laughs> but a whole range of chemistry. If you look at cometary chemistry overall, they're mostly water with traces of CO, CO2, and methanol, and then all the other organics are in a little bitty sliver, but there's a lot of organic complexity in comets, and we're just now getting to the point where observations are sensitive enough to be able to see the material that gets 
volatilized off of the comet as it gets closer to the sun. So people like Stephanie Milam are doing this every time there's a comet that gets close enough, they trigger an observation, then off they go. Martin Cordner is also doing that. Um, so yeah, lots of fun things to come with cometary chemistry. So I mentioned the impacts in early Earth. Um, actually, one of the major impacts was the formation of the moon. So there was a large object that hit the early Earth, tore off part of the Earth, and mixed some of the chemistry of the impactor and the early Earth and ended up forming the moon. Um, so that was an impact of it that was cataclysmic, to say the very least. But at some point, those impacts slowed down, the surface cooled, water condensed, and Earth's oceans formed, and then chemistry started as as we know it from early Earth up to this day. Um, the concept of abiogenesis is the origination of living organisms from lifeless matter. So in the realm of astrobiology research, a lot of groups are trying to understand how we got from this very hot Hadean early Earth surface to liquid water to the ingredients for life and um, what triggers those processes, what came in as Earth formed, what came from comets, what came from meteorites, and then what formed in the oceans and on the clays at the edges of the oceans. Um, so there are a lot of different scenarios in terms of abiogenesis. I could have given a whole hour-long talk on this. This is what I teach my freshmen in my freshman seminar on Are We Alone? They think they're going to talk about aliens all semester, and I teach them origin of life theories. Um, so panspermia is material coming in from outside of Earth. Primordial soup goes all the way back to Darwin. Um, the idea is we have this warm little pond of organic chemistry, and from that all of the ingredients of life develops. Of course, electric spark is the classic Uri Miller experiment, where you have your primordial soup with a certain composition, a certain atmospheric composition, you have lightning, and that triggers basically organic synthesis to occur, and larger biological molecules can form. Um, there's a lot of work around deep sea vents. There was actually a really beautiful paper about a year ago where a group basically made a deep sea vent in a flask in the lab and monitored the chemistry as it ran which was really cool. Um, but deep sea vents are these little hot spots of life in the middle of the ocean where their life just flourishes around these vents. And so the idea is that these may have been points where metabolic processes started and then <coughs> delivered material to develop life from metabolism first. Um, Stanley Miller actually did this really fascinating experiment later in life where he put in some of the simple ingredients from the Uri Miller experiment into an ice, basically, slurry. And he kept it on ice for something like 20 years <laughs> and made all sorts of amino acids out of it. It's really incredible. Um, he went in every, every day and added um, whatever he needed to keep it cold. And the idea there is if you look at a condensation of solution where you lower the temperature and ice starts to form, you can actually very rapidly drive up the concentration of molecules in that cold solution because the ice is forming and so the liquid that's left gets more and more and more concentrated. And so you can actually drive really complex organic chemistry at very low temperatures. Um, so he was arguing that maybe life started on icebergs. Um, interesting. <laughs> Um, clays have also gained a lot of attention. The way that clays are constructed, you can trap polar organic molecules between the layers of the clays. So the thinking is, if we've got organic molecules in the primordial soup, and the waves come in and crash on the shoreline, and clays are there to trap those molecules, they can then serve as reaction promoters to be able to build larger molecules. Um, and I mentioned metabolism first, that's kind of tied to deep sea vents, but it's a little more complicated than that. So you can set up metabolic pathways um, without actually having life and then eventually develop cells from there if you can make a membrane, basically. That's the hard part, is making the cell membrane. 
And then the one that gets a lot of attention is RNA world. The idea is somehow RNA formed. But once you get RNA, everything else for life is easy because it self-replicates. So there's a whole school of thought in evolutionary biology where people start with something like RNA and then go from there trying to build life from scratch. Um, there are a lot of groups that are trying to make synthetic versions of RNA and DNA so that they can make self-replicating systems, self-assembling systems. Um, when I teach my freshman seminar, I have them debate all of these after we work through each of them. And you can kind of tell the chemists like metabolism first because it's bottom up. And the biologists like RNA world because it's top down. And I can, with my freshman, I can tell you who's going to be a chemistry major and who's going to be a biology major based on these two. Um, and that's, that's a step two, right? What's that? That's a step two. Yeah, that's the step two. And then a miracle occurs. Uh, matter, life. We don't know what happens in the middle. Um, <laughs> does, does, it, it, does it only have to be one mechanism? Can no. look at life today and say that it cannot have been two mechanisms? I think it was probably a combination of all of these, personally. Um, it's very hard for me to come up with any one of these that gets you to all of the ingredients. Like metabolism first gets you to sugars and carbohydrates. You need RNA to get to DNA, well, maybe. Um, but likely, you need an RNA to get to DNA to do the coding and do the replication. Very few of these deal with building the membrane. And there have been groups that have actually looked at vesicles and their formation in solution. Um, I think it was Art Weber actually put several molecules that are known interstellar molecules in a solution of water and it spontaneously formed vesicles, which is amazing. So maybe those were early cell membranes, it's unclear. Um, there's some work on deep sea vents where there might have been metal, spherical metal molecules that could have acted as early membranes and then they got replaced with lipids later. Um, it, it's, it's not clear to me. That step seems to me to be the hardest. The rest of it, there are plausible hypotheses out there, but the membranes, I'm, I'm not sure. So, based on that, um, I almost put in slides about the Drake equation, but decided to not go in that direction because it's not really astrochemistry so much as philosophy. Um, <laughs> But it's amazing, when Frank Drake wrote down the Drake equation, we didn't know hardly any of the terms, and now we know the answer to about half of them, because we know there are planets in almost every solar system, and many of them are habitable, at least in terms of liquid water. So we are making progress. So I've had a lot of people ask me this question this week, so I thought I would put this up and see what you think, but then Stefano said no chemical clocks, and that's my first thing. <laughs> Um, so I think astrochemistry is evolving as a field. We spent a lot of time this week talking about star formation, um, but planets are hot right now because of the telescopes that we have and the things we can observe, and that's really where things are going in terms of understanding how we go through this evolution from clouds to stars to disks to planets to solar system chemistry. Um, so disk chemistry, planetary evolution, those are big question marks in a lot of respects right now. Um, I know there are people like Karin working on it, but um, only a handful of people really pushing hard into the chemistry in this. Um, getting the models to the point where they're quantitative and hopefully predictive at some point. Um, looking at clocks in terms of things that strictly form in the gas or on the grain, or I think you're right about the ratios. I think that is the way to go. Can we find molecules where if we observe a certain ratio between two species, we know exactly how old the object is or what the thermal history of the object is? Or people have tried for a long time to come up with systems where this would work, and I think we're just now getting enough comprehensive information to be able to start to piece that together. 
Exoplanet atmospheres, I think, is the next big thing. I put biosignatures question mark because even in this room, we can't agree on what a biosignature <laughs> is. Um, I think habitability may be the thing we should look for instead of biosignatures per se. Um, freshmen like to argue that life doesn't have to be life as we know it on Earth, and we should be expanding our horizons, which is an interesting philosophical debate, but so far we haven't seen any good models from chemistry. Um, origin of life, what are the starting materials? Are some of the sources that we look at in the universe extraordinary examples rather than common examples? Um, Everybody that looks at star formation looks at Orion and Sagittarius, but they are so far out of line with the rest of the star forming regions. Are we missing the important stuff because we're looking at something that's exceptional? Um, Hexos was a key program on Herschel, and it was Herschel observations of extraordinary sources. <laughs> um, and then solar system chemistry. We are rapidly approaching a couple of new missions that will really give us a lot of really valuable information. Uh, as I mentioned, Dragonfly is the quadcopter going to Titan. It's got to fly the minute they release it in the atmosphere. If it doesn't fly, they're done. Um, and then sample return missions. So there's a, a return mission out right now called Osiris Rex that's actually going to collect samples from an asteroid and bring them back. Um, and had Caesar been chosen, Caesar would have gone back to 67P and brought back samples. So there are a lot of ideas on the table to be able to explore our own solar system and learn more about the chemistry. So there's a lot coming down the pipeline. More and more when I go to astrochemistry meetings, I see people from the planetary science community um, who do these sort of analytical techniques and look at things in our own solar system and are trying to draw conclusions based on what we see in our neighborhood versus what we see in other solar systems. So with that, I'll stop. I'm happy to take any questions that you have. I'm leaving right after this, so thank you. But not before the picture. Not before the picture. Michael, let me leave. But thank you for having me, and it's been a lot of fun. Keep going, grad students. You're great. You ask great questions. <laughs> Summer puts our hand up. <laughs> Where would you go and what would you measure? 
Um, and one year, they were insistent that we should build an experiment like the Yuri Miller experiment and go purposely seed something like Enceladus and then sit back and see what happens. And I was like, you want to what? I was horrified. Um, they were like, yeah, it's fine. We don't think there's anything there. We can use it as our own little experimental reactor. And it was like, oh no. <laughs> we got into some really fantastic ethics debates over that one. They were just insistent. But yeah. science, and I was like, ooh. Yeah. Uh, this might be a lame non chemist question, but it was, I guess, the magma phase hot enough to ionize Earth's atmosphere? And if so, did that kind of thing add any theories to that kind of biogenic system? I don't know. I know that the oxygen came in much later. Um, once we started building up biomass, oxygen was pretty low early on. So there's a lot of debate about the Yuri Miller experiments because the atmospheric composition they chose doesn't actually match um, what we now know to be early Earth's atmosphere. But people have gone back and rerun under the other conditions and they still see all sorts of crazy organic molecules forming. Yeah? What about the nitrogen? Does it play a role? Uh, it it certainly any? does in building up things. Like if you do a Yuri Miller experiment, um, the nitrogen that's necessary to get to amino acids. So, yeah. But in the biosignatures, uh, you did mention it. Uh, you mentioned... Uh, I don't know that it directly traces any biological processes. People argue that ozone is the one to really look for. Because it's so strong in Earth's atmosphere, and it's related to the oxygen chemistry. Yeah. Uh, okay, I know people don't usually look at Venus because it doesn't seem to be interesting for Earth-like life, but have right. they even looked at the atmosphere of Venus? Like, what's actually... Yeah, there have been studies of Venus's uh, atmosphere and drinking into the chemistry. Um, does that look cool? It's very volcanically active. There are a lot of sulfur-containing gases in the atmosphere. I know there's some planetary science chemistry groups that are interested in reactions in Venus's atmosphere. Veronica Vita at Boulder was studying Venus chemistry. Can you say two sentences about your undergraduate asteroids work? Or meteor work, I mean. Oh, my undergraduate work, yes. Um, I did an uh, undergraduate project, I actually worked on it the whole four years I was there. We were analyzing uh, sediments related to meteorite impacts. So we were looking for evidence of wildfires triggered by impact events. Um, my undergrad research advisor was the one that showed that there's a massive amount of soot at the KT boundary where the dinosaurs became extinct. Um, and they thought it was triggered by the impact event because, you know, nuclear winter, everything died and then everything burned. Um, and my she had a geologist who did deep sea core drilling in the middle of the Pacific while I was an undergrad and we got samples from that project and we actually showed that the soot layer for the KT boundary was global. It couldn't have been deposited by runoff. It had to be Aeolian transport. And so it was actually a global soot layer. And out of the same deep sea cores, that geologist, Frank Kite, actually found pieces of the impactor from the KT boundary. Um, so I was looking at that. I also looked at another impactor that was old enough that it was before there was significant biomass on Earth and we still saw soot. So we actually think it was burning the carbon in the sediments and in the impactor to make soot. Um, there's a lot of work about soot and how it relates to fullerene formation and a lot of thinking, the soot is round, so they think it's actually C60 molecules that don't quite close, and then it keeps wrapping, and it's like an onion. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of work in kind of uh, geological chemistry and atmospheric chemistry and combustion, looking at soot formation and what conditions drive it to soot over C60. So the thinking is that the fires contributed to that. 
That's an interesting side comment, Daniel. It's small. It's small. <laughs> yeah, the small you found C60 suits, right? Yeah. I don't know, I was just a comment on that. I'm going to take care as deflate. There are extreme there are extreme system like uh free flowing planet come with actual moves that mm -hmm. can also fly yeah. probably at the moment. Yeah. There is no need of the presence of a star or a TPL system to be right. in our factory. Right. This, uh, this was just a that may actually be more likely for life to not be in a solar type system. Yeah. yeah. Exo moons are hard to observe though. Maybe someday. There is one. There's one? Yeah. Good. Probably. Probably. <laughs> Any other questions? Not much time, Susanna. Yeah.